Hey guys, so this video is gonna be going over the uh, PCB layout of the LED board tester. And I was originally going to do this as a time-lapse. I actually have all the time-lapse footage, but it was like a six hour layout. And no matter how I tried, I couldn't cut it down into a short video that actually made sense. But luckily I have all of the commits on GitHub. So what I'm gonna do is just go over like three or four changes in the layout and kind of talk through how it became like a four layer board and why I decided to do things that I did. We can jump into, I guess let's jump into the 3D view of the board. The large pins right here, they lock into mounting holes on the panel of boards and then these are spring contacts. So when it's pushed down, they will spring up to here. Those go on surface mount pads on the LED boards themselves. And I made sure to make these a tiny bit longer until these are properly aligned and locked in. There's no way that these can make contact just to avoid having any shorts or anything, of course. This was the first round of the layout, roughly placing most of the components, kind of getting an idea where everything goes. Big thing with this, it's a really wide board. Like it's pushing like 15, 16 inches. Any type of board like that, regardless of the thickness, is gonna have some flex to it. So what I did is I have an open solder mask pad here, which is a half inch deep or a half inch wide. And what I'm gonna do is attach on like a stainless steel flat, and that should help prevent this from flexing really whatsoever. On this first cut, I had it as like a 20 volt bus bar, but that probably wasn't a good idea, so I removed that. With this layout, I always, start with the most important block first, and that's the ADC side, making sure that that has a clean ground. And you'll see a lot of people with mixed signal boards who will do a split ground plane. So they'll have one section of ground, one plane for ground that is only analog signals, and then they'll join it to the digital section right under the chip, which works, but the problem that I've seen when people do that is they get too comfortable with it and they say, oh, it's a split plane, there's only an analog, we're good to go. You can have huge issues with that if you have digital signals or any signals really that have to go around that break in the plane, then come back. I find it better to have a single ground plane if it's a two layer board and just make sure no digital signals cross it. So what I mean by that is here's our op amp. This is the analog uh, ADC chip. So on all of these lines are low voltage analog signals. You don't want any digital, any high speed or any digital signal at all going across these. That also means return paths. So what you wanna make sure you do is this entire section over here, all digital signals, not just their traces, but where their return paths don't cross any of these traces. This switch is the only signal, even if we route the trace down here and around these, that return current is gonna have to essentially follow where that rat's nest line back to where it's sent from, back to this chip. That is an incredibly low speed signal and it's only gonna be pressed every once in a while. While it may cause some noise there, it's gonna be so intermittent and it's it's not really a digital signal that, that shouldn't be an issue. Even if we keep these as a single ground plane, it's not gonna be, we're not gonna have to worry about any noise because no digital signals cross here. This is essentially an analog section of the plane, even though it's connected to the digital ground plane. So that was the first thing I laid out. Then after that, the next thing we wanna work on is the switching regulator. Basically, your input caps need to be as close as possible to the chip, your inductor, and then the loop from your inductor to their caps need to be as close to the chip as possible. And then any of your switching loops, which is gonna be right here, you wanna have that loop area minimized. And then the last thing is any of your ground planes that go from your chip ground on the regulator to the capacitors, if possible, 
you want to keep that all on the top plane. So once that is laid out, and another thing with this, what I always do is when I start the layout, I do all of the traces at eight mil, just so I can get an idea of where everything's gonna go. And then I will expand them to the actual trace widths. So after those two are done, pretty much everything else is just secondary, just placing things where it seems like they make sense. For this chip, making sure that the caps are as, or that cap and that cap are close to the chip. I'm making sure that the ground uh, switching MOSFET, that is close to the driver because this loop right here will have a pretty big current surge when it goes to turn this chip on. And then other than that, it's really just placement. That was kind of the first round of placement. And now I'll open up the second one, which is when I switch to the four layer board. So here is the second round or the second cut of the board. And another big thing, don't be intimidated by four layer boards. Four layer boards are actually way easier in virtually every regard, both of layout and actually having a better working board, just because you can have yourself one or two full ground planes. And as long as you don't put anything on them, it's gonna tend to work out fine. Uh, I see a lot, also a lot of people getting intimidated by going up in layers. It's way easier to make a good board in a four layer than it is with a two layer, even if you're experienced. So this stack up for the layers isn't standard. Typically you do signal on the top and bottom and ground or power planes in the inner. And that just makes it so it's easier to do rework. But for this one, the top plane is ground with signal traces. The bottom is ground with signal traces. The inner top layer is almost all ground right in this section there's a power plane for 3.3 volts and then these are the analog traces and then the inner bottom layer is all 20 volts and another thing the reason why power and ground planes are interchanged a lot when it's talking about stack ups is return currents don't care if they're on a ground or a power plane, having a continuous 20 volt power plane for signal continuity is identical of having just a ground plane. So you can get away with stuff like that. And the reason I went with a stack up like this was simple. The analog traces, I wanted to have those shielded from the top and bottom with a ground or a power plane to help keep any external noise from getting on them because these are like some of them 14 inch long antennas essentially. And then the changes otherwise on this layout, we're moving everything in towards the center of the board. And that's because right here is where your hand's gonna go when you're actually using this. And I figured it probably would be better not touching all the components. Uh, so that's why all of those are moved in. I then, since now it's a four layer board, I had the ability of moving over the MOSFETs and having a bus bar here on the bottom layer, which gives the switched ground to all of the testers. And then for 20 volts, it made it super easy because all we had to do is throw these stitching vias into our 20 volt plane. So that was really the biggest improvement is now we have full continuity from the 20 volts to all of these. And here you can see that Kelvin connection. So all the high current goes from here across the shunt resistor through the fuse and out. And the only thing that goes on these small traces is the op amp sensing the voltage differential. You never wanna have these traces on the outside or even worse, having the 20 volts come here because then these are gonna also measure the resistance of that high current loop. And then other than that, pretty much everything on this board is just made a lot cleaner by going to four layers. And there's a, like I said, a 3.3 volt plane here. And this was not a good idea. And I removed it in the next layout and I'll explain why. So I'll open up the uh, third cut now. So here is the third cut of the board. There's not a ton different. You can see now I've started to widen the traces to what their final trace width would be. And I removed that 3.3 volt pour. 
and replaced it just with traces on the top and bottom layers. And that was because this plane is a pretty much continuous ground from here to here with that 3.3 volts cutting it up there really wasn't a good pathway for any ground to get here. So it was easy enough to just add that all on the top layer. And there were also a couple schematic changes. So I changed the input voltage from the uh, switching regulator to five volts, and that made it easier for the op amp output without it being over volting on the ADC. So that was a pretty big change uh, logic wise. And you can see here, I forgot to change all of those over. For the MOSFET driver, I had forgotten some decoupling caps and I believe that's the only change schematically there. The other big change on this revision is I separated out this top pour from the 20 volt layer to be just an analog ground right there. It's a separate analog ground. And I know I said I didn't separate out an analog and a digital ground plane. These will be stitched together with all of the other digital grounds. The only reason I did that is if it were to be on 20 volts, the entire plane, there's always going to be some sort of noise that's present on that 20 volt pour, mainly from the switching regulator and anything from the input supply. And I didn't want that noise to be directly over here. So by tying it to ground, you still will get some of that coupled noise from both of those sources, but it tends to be attenuated a little bit better just because it's at a ground potential and not at a 20 volt potential. Other than that, that's pretty much it for this one. So now on to the final draft. So this is the final revision. This is where I'm at now. I haven't sent it for fab yet, but unless I see any other changes, this should be the final version. So with this one, the stitching vias were added. All of the traces were widened to their final width. And the main changes were on the schematic end. I remembered to change the five volts all around. And then on the five volt supply for the ADC, I added a LC filter with a fairly large inductor. And what that does is essentially this switching regulator is switched at 250 kilohertz. And that means that they're even with these output caps, there's gonna be some switch mode noise on this five volt. So by adding an LC filter here, that should help to lower the noise threshold that is on this chip. This gives a attenuation of like 87 kilohertz will block above that. And of course, it's still gonna let some through, which means most of the switch mode noise from here should not make it into our ADC chip which should make our readings a lot better. And then I think also I added a cap right here, which it, the data sheet recommended. And then other than that, the layout itself, adding those stitching vias to tie all of the planes together and to make sure that there's no open ground pours. So to recap, keeping the analog signals all up in one section of the board and keeping all of the digital signals on a separate section and making sure that there's no digital lines, e either the signal lines or the return paths that will cross over any of the analog section is a really good way without having to use separate ground planes that you can do a mixed signal board like this. So I hope you guys enjoyed this and let me know if you liked this style of video, kind of going through revision by revision. And of course, let me know in the comments if you have any suggestions for future videos, and I will see you in the next one.